Well, we're going to break bread today thinking about Revelation chapter 3, the letters of the Lord Jesus to some of the early churches. Let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you believing that you are real and that your Son, the Lord Jesus, is equally real and active in our lives today. And Father, we can't wait, as it were, to, to see and hear again how he actually looks at his people from heaven today, because we know that he looks at us too, just as he did 2,000 years ago or so to, to those people, those believers to whom he wrote. We know, Father, we believe that he searches hearts and minds, and so do you. We bring ourselves before you then, Father, loving you, not fearing you, but loving you, wishing to be absolutely open before you and to know you and your Son and to grow in that relationship. Father, we come taking with us our past, our present and our, the future, which includes our human sin and failure. And we ask you, Father, to strengthen our faith in your love and in your desire to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness through him and to lead us to your intention, which is eternal life in your kingdom. Father, that is all our hope and all our desire to be in your kingdom. And we do pray that it will come soon and that very soon we shall take in some form these elements again when we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we are aware that each of us personally and all your children all over the world are in times of suffering and tribulation and testing. We pray, Father, for your especial strength to those who really are having particularly acute and intense times of testing. Those struggling with their health, the health of their loved ones, those who feel they're in a tunnel with no light at the end, those who are in terrible domestic situations, those who are mentally disturbed, those with mental health issues, those, Father, who feel that temptation is too strong for them. We pray, Father, for your special blessing upon them. And we pray that we might be empowered by you to be a light to others, both those who have already believed and a light to the world. Please give us the opportunities, Father, to do that. Please open our lives and look into our lives and, and lead us in the right paths of the right meetings with the appropriate people at the appropriate times. Please go with us, Father, and bless our witness, bless our desire to love you and to serve you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So, Revelation 3. These are, as we said in our prayers, the actual words of the risen Jesus to his people. And this is a unique insight into how life with the Lord Jesus is for us today, because this is how he was after he descended to heaven 2,000 years ago, very involved in the lives of his people. So verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now stop. The stars are, we're told, the churches. Seven, number of completeness. Sure, there were seven churches he was writing to, but the idea is that the seven stars, the seven churches, these are all the churches, the groups that make up the body of Jesus. And a church is ultimately people. That's the whole thing, not a building, but people. And he's got the seven spirits of God. Well, seven is completeness, so he has got complete power, as we're told. He has got all power in heaven and earth. And the seven spirits that he holds, that is the unlimited power of God, are related to the seven stars. In other words, all this huge power, the seven spirits, the completeness of God's power, is there working for the seven stars, the seven churches, the body of Christ, however you want to put it. We people who make up the seven stars, the, the people of God. So God is not far off. God is not passive. God is very active in absolutely, absolute involvement with us, with all that he's got, and he's got everything. So, verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Well, in each of these letters, he seems to be saying, sort yourselves out, you're in a terribly bad way, spiritually, and 
I'm going to come soon and judge. I'm going to very soon vindicate the righteous and judge the wicked. Urgently get yourselves ready. Well, I explained the last time we chatted about the, the letters and Revelation generally that I, I see the book of Revelation as written fairly early, certainly before AD 70. And I say that because the, the, the vials and the seals that we're going to read about later on in the book are all clearly alluding to the Olivet Prophecy, which was a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and yet it also clearly refers to our last days. So then, this message to the churches in the last days and the lead up to AD 70 could not be more relevant than for us. We who are members of the seven stars, the churches, the body of Christ, just before Jesus is finally going to come. And the state of affairs generally overall in those churches was pathetically weak. Well, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Well, I think there's plenty of evidence to say that, yes, there will be some who are alive and remain, who will be snatched away, 1 Thessalonians 4, and shall live forever with the Lord and be accepted. But I fear to say this, but it's true. I think the biblical evidence is that the body of Christ, however you wish to define that, be it your local church, your group of churches, your fellowship, however you want to look at it, is going to be very weak, very weak. And so this is all a call to radical individualism, to not just go along with the flow, well, these days in the church we do this, or we think that, or whatever. It's between you and the Lord Jesus. And I fear that the evidence is, particularly from these letters to the seven churches, the body of Christ as I see it, the evidence seems to be that things will not be well spiritually, in the vast majority of the body of Christ, however, as I say, you wish to define that. So, be watchful, verse 3. Hold fast, repent, and if you will not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Well, the thief-like coming of Jesus is to the unprepared in the ecclesia. So, clearly alluding to the Lord's own words, that Stay awake and watch. Stay awake. Do not go to sleep. And Paul develops that one Thessalonians when he says, let us not sleep. Lest that day overtake you as a thief. Don't let it be unexpected. What? Jesus has come? Oh, as unexpected as a thief in the night. And you wake up, oh, the thief has been. Because I wasn't watching. And yet, to some extent, the day of the Lord's coming is presented as unexpected to those alive at his coming. Classic example is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. They all slumber and sleep. They all slumber and sleep. And Paul seems to allude to that in 1 Thessalonians when he says, let us not sleep as do others, but let us be awake and let us not go to sleep. But the Lord's parable says that at the time of his coming, all his people will be sleepy when they shouldn't be. And the wise are only saved because they had the humility to recognize that might happen. And they'd taken more oil with them in case that happened. And in case it was going to be longer than they expected. So, again, the implication is, yes, watch. But who is going to watch? And again, this is all alluding back to the Lord's words in Gethsemane to the disciples, do not go to sleep, but watch and pray. And they didn't, did they? So the overall picture is not great, I don't think, about the state of the believers in the last days. So remember that and don't allow the norms that there are in the body of Christ, however you define that, to define how you feel and behave. You see, if you're in this personal relationship with Jesus, the norms of behavior and attitude in your particular local church or group that you mix with or whatever, in whatever form you mix with them, that's neither here nor there. You're waiting for Jesus and you're with him and watching for him to come back. So, verse 4, he says, You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in, in white. 
Now, I'd like to just start off by observing that he doesn't say, ah, those few names in Sardis who are not defiled, uh, yeah, but I have this against you that you didn't quit the church, that you didn't get out of the church. No. That Jesus does not operate any kind of guilt by association. And it's that view that has destroyed so much of the body of Christ. That, oh, but they go to a church or an ecclesia where there is a false teacher, where there are people who do this, that, or the other. Yeah, that doesn't mean that you don't therefore accept those faithful individuals who are within that group. There is no guilt by association in that sense. And Jesus does not condemn or rebuke the few names in Sardis. But on a more spiritual level, he doesn't say you have a few brethren or you have a few people in Sardis. He says you have a few names. He talks about people as if they are names. Now, in Hebrew thought, a name reflects a character in a unique and personal way. And I think the idea is that we each have a unique and personal name with God. We've all got this unique fingerprint, this unique iris. We've all had a unique genetic history. There is no one like you. And your spirituality, your spiritual relationship with the Lord Jesus is likewise unique. And so he says in verse 5 about the faithful, I will confess his name before my father at the last day, and I will not blot out his name from the book. So then my name is not Duncan, your name is not Svetlana or Johnny or, or whatever. Our name is the summation of who you are as a person. It's why it's too simplistic to say, oh, God's name is Yahweh. Well, yes and no. God made himself a name, we're told. He has developed that name because it refers not to a lexical item, if you like, YHWH, but to his personality as developed, as manifested, as displayed over history, over time. And so we are names to God, and we each have a unique name. We read in chapter 2 that we will be given a name, actually, that nobody else knows apart from you and the Lord Jesus. There is something, or oh, what Paul calls the hidden man, or Peter calls the hidden man. There, there is this deeply personal element to each of us that God alone knows. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 that we know God, or discern God, and he discerns us, but we are discerned by no man. We are discerned by no man, which I think what that means is that nobody can quite enter into your personal, the personal nature of your walk with the Lord, because you had an absolutely unique path in life. And even if you sat down with me, or I sat down with you for days and nights drinking coffee together, telling each other about ourselves and all that, at the end of it, you still wouldn't get it about me, and I would not get it about you. No man can discern. He himself is discerned of no man, Paul says. And this is the idea here. We are names. There's a few names in Sardis. I will not blot out his name from the book. I will confess his name, etc. And of course, the, the tragedy is that some people's names will be blotted out of the book of life. Other people's names will not be. Which is a scary thought that some people were on track to live forever. But their name was taken out of the scroll of life. So there is a future we might miss. And although I believe we should be absolutely confident that if the Lord returns at this moment, or we die at this moment, we can just die like that, and it claps in front of you from a heart attack. You can get in your car, drive home, and bang, you know, scribbled in a car crash, just, just like that. All the same, although we should be confident of his salvation at this present moment, there must always be that appropriate fear of the future, the eternity, that we might miss if we fall away. And I think God has structured things like that so that we have that appropriate humility that man should have before his God. 
Well, verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, says he that is holy and true, the Lord Jesus. Here you've got an example, one of very many throughout the book of Revelation, of where the titles and terms used about Caesar in the imperial cult are applied to Jesus. The classic one, not in Revelation actually, but is when Paul calls Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, sorry, that is also in Revelation. Um, that was a direct affront to the imperial cult. Caesar is the only Lord and our only King. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of all Lords in the Empire. And to say otherwise was a criminal, even capital, offence. The book of Revelation, therefore, would have been underground literature. This book, according to Roman law, was illegal at the time because it is purposefully picking up the titles of Caesar and applying them to the Lord Jesus. So to be a Christian then is the same as it is now. It was a radical, radical statement. Absolutely radical. Now, there's a radical in all of us actually, or well, they should be. And yeah, you see it in teenagers, they dye their hair pink and they want to paint their room yellow with green spots on it or whatever. As you get older, you know, that sort of goes away somewhat. But there should be a radical in each of us. I want to be not a little bit different. I want to be really different. And it is here where true Christianity absolutely meets that need to be radical. So what if you dye your hair red or green with pink spots or whatever. Um, so what? It's a statement that you want to be different a little more. Whereas the call of true Christianity is something radical. Not, it's not a call to be aggressive, but it is a call to be radically different. Absolutely radically different. And that is why it, the quite nicest thing to see is a teenager, an adolescent young person who's got all that desire to be different, who grasps true Christianity and says, wow, this is my way. This is my way. I shall not save my money to go on a holiday to whatever, some such place uh, with my mates and uh, get drunk and do drugs or whatever. No, I'm going to save my money to go to this way out little place I heard of in the middle of nowhere in Africa or South America or somewhere and tell people about Jesus Christ, something like that. That's the, the call that meets human desire to be different and the radical that there is in each of us. And even if you're an older person and the years have rather washed all that away, it's still there. Be in touch with yourself. Don't go with all this mire of mediocrity, which gets older people as they get older. No, keep that radical within you and see that that desire is perfectly met in the call of the Lord Jesus. Just like in Soviet days, when Solzhenitsyn wrote one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, that was forbidden literature, and fine brother Igor Sipiagov, who sleeps now in the Lord, told me how, as a young guy, he was typing that out on a typewriter with onion skin carbon paper to make as many copies as he could of it to distribute in the underground, uh, underground movements uh, in the Soviet Union. Well... That's how the book of Revelation would have been in the first century. Wow, this is an absolutely radical inversion of society, of the whole culture of the imperial cult that we live under. And this is the radical call to have Jesus as absolute Lord in our lives. Not for us the values which are that, you know, I, I shall uh, get wealthy, I shall build up my stash, I shall get this great career, I shall have this cool house and these certain types of cars and I shall retire early and all this kind of stuff. No, absolutely the other way. You know, I shall have a stone built house in the countryside and, uh, you know, this, that and the other. No, no. Throw those dreams away and invert them. Absolutely invert them. I shall be a humble servant of others and my greatest dream would be too whatever it is, lead men and women to Jesus, baptise people, whatever it is, radically change the life of a drug addict to, to radically bring a, a transformation of character to the 
apparently permanently depressed lady who lives up the street, or whatever it might be. So, <clears throat> verse 10. But all that, you know, it depends to some degree, well, a lot, on our own free will, on whether you want to do this. So verse 10, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation or tribulation or testing, which will come upon all the world, to test them that dwell upon the earth. I take that to be the earth or the land of, of Israel. But anyway, idea is there would come a time of tribulation. The Lord Jesus clearly stated this in the Olivet Prophecy, but in the case of the faithful in Philadelphia, he says, you've kept the word of my patience, you won't need to go through that. Remember that I said that all this applies to us in the last days. And I think, therefore, that there will be a time of testing. Because the church is so weak, we are so weak. And if we are going to be in that generation that is alive and remains when the Lord comes, we, therefore, will never die. He will come and we'll meet him and, and we shall not taste of death. But if that's going to be the case, we need a radical shake-up. And that is why there is a teaching about the time of tribulation. But he says here, because you kept the word of my patience, you won't go through it. Well, if you skip back to chapter 2, verse 10, you shall have, sorry, you may have tribulation ten days, but be faithful to death. He writes there to the uh, believers in Smyrna. You may have tribulation ten days. He doesn't say you will. He says you might do. And it's the same idea here. It's open. It's an open possibility. Will we go through a time of testing or not? You could look at Bible verses that say yes, and then you could look at others that say no. You know, Come, my people, Isaiah 26, enter into your chambers until the indignation is overpassed will be preserved from it. And you can say, oh no, but, but Jesus is clear in the Olivet Prophecy that you, you, shall, be, uh, you shall be tested, uh, etc. So, it depends whether we have fallen asleep now and whether the time of tribulation is desperately needed to wake us up or whether like these faithful in Philadelphia, you've kept the word of his endurance, of his patience, so therefore I will keep you from that time of tribulation. Well, he goes on then in uh, 15, uh, about the Laodiceans. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. But did he really wish they were cold? No, surely he wished they were hot. So I think as it stands, we need to read in an ellipsis here. I think the idea is, therefore, this is not a translation, this is a case of reading in an ellipsis. I'm happy to chat with you about that afterwards, but I think that in interpreting Scripture, especially New Testament Greek, you do at times have to do that. I don't think he's saying, oh, I wish you were cold, absolutely stone cold towards me, or hot. I think he's saying, I wish that you would realize that. That is the ellipsis. I wish you would realize that you can either be cold or hot. Um, but you are not. You are lukewarm, and who likes drinking lukewarm water? I will spew you out of my mouth. So there is a huge logic in devotion. There are only two ways. Book of Proverbs. There's the way of folly, and there's a way of wisdom. There's the woman wisdom and the woman folly, etc. There is no third road. We would all desperately wish for there to be a third road. How I wish that... You know, the Catholic idea of purgatory would be true. We'd all sign up for that. Yeah, I'm not really so righteous, but I'm not, I'm not a hardcore sinner either. Oh, yeah, there's a third path. Yeah, yeah, you suffer for a bit, you, you get sorted out, and then you live forever after, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, give me that. that that's, that that'll be right. Oh, I love that. That'll be true. I'd, I'd vote for that any day. But <laughs> there's no purgatory. That's not, sorry, but that's nonsense. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible instead presents only two possible outcomes from the day of judgment, eternal life or eternal death. There are only two paths, the way to life and the way to death. The Lord Jesus uses those figures. Wide is the way and the gate that goes to death, and many go down it, and no is the way that goes to life, and few find it. So it, it is as simple as that. And he's, he's saying, I wish you'd realize this. 
you're either on fire for me or you're stone cold. You think that you can be lukewarm and oh, that's sort of okay. How would you uh, sort of analyze yourself? How, how would you sort of rate your spirituality? People would say, well, I'm, I'm not stone cold, I believe, you know. Ah, oh, but I'm not. I'm not really red hot. I might have switched on to it. So what? You're lukewarm. Do you not see that? He hates that. So there's only one way, and you'll be rejected. You'll be spewed out. The answer to this whole thing is, well, are you hot or cold? You're one or the other. No, lukewarm is not an answer. That's the same as being stone cold. In fact, even more annoying for Jesus. So the logic of total devotion it is so absolutely clear. If there's no third road and there's a way to death and a way to life, well, go on that way to life and run that way. As David said, I will run in the way of your commandments. I want to go that way with my whole heart and soul. And sure, Romans 7, as Paul says, you know, I don't do that which I would love to do. And Hebrews, the sin that does so easily beset us. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to run in that path with all my, all my heart. This affects radically our idea of hobbies, of chilling out, of relaxation, of career, of choices that you make, what you spend your money on, what especially you set your hopes on. I so hope for that fantastic 30 grand new kitchen or whatever it might be. That fantastic car, I've got my eye on it, just saving up and hoping to persuade the bank to give me a bit of a bigger loan than I could get it. No. No, no, no. This is the lukewarm thing. Then I say, oh, yes, well, of course, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm not an atheist, you know. I'm actually a believer. I go to church and yeah, I read the Bible, actually, now and again. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is the way of religion. And Jesus hates this. If he died for me, if the Lord Jesus died for me, that's everything. A man died for me. What am I going to do? Shrug and say, oh, yeah, I'll think about that now and again. No. This is everything. Take my heart. Take my life. And let it be holy for you. As I say, notwithstanding the ties that bind, unfortunately, in the weakness of our humanity. Okay, that, that's one thing. But in our heart, 100%, that's what we should want to give. There's a very powerful logic here. So, 17, but because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the lukewarm attitude is connected with materialism. And when the Lord says here that you say, I am rich and increased with goods, he is clearly talking about people's unconscious self-talk. That's their self-talk. And he's using the very same Greek word used about the rich fool, who says, I have laid up treasure. Yeah, here I am increased with goods. That's just what the rich fool said in his own self-talk. And he said, and you need to realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Well, what does that mean? It means you need to recognize your own desperation. Same word, Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am. Well, he was there. He wasn't saying I'm rich and increased with goods. He was saying I'm oh, wretched man that I am. And 17, you've got to recognize that you are wretched and poor. Same word, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are spiritually poor and know it. That's the point. So how often, I ask you, how often do you feel before God and the Lord Jesus Oh, wretched man that I am. I hate what I do and I hate my failure. Not half-heartedly, but saying with Paul, Oh God, oh wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this weakness? Saying to the Lord Jesus, I am spiritually poor. I'm poor in spirit, but I really want to be more spiritual. Right. That's the attitude. Rather than, I'm okay. Oh, I'm okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, my material blessings are a proof that God is behind me. Nonsense. That's not, that's the very mistake they were making. It's the big mistake of the Pentecostal movement, in my opinion. To say that uh, if, if, if you're wealthy, God's blessed you. Not at all. Not at all. The very opposite taught here. And so, verse 20. Jesus says, 
I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. I'll have supper with him, I'll eat with him, and he with me. So he stands at the door now and knocks, and we are to open the door, and he will come in and eat with us. And it's mutual, it emphasizes it. I will eat with him, and he will eat with me. That might sound like wasting words, but he's emphasizing it. I will eat with him, and he will eat with me. So... This connects, of course, with, with Luke 12, 36, where the Lord uses just this same language. This is the same Jesus who is speaking in Revelation as who spoke in his ministry. Where he says that at the last day, he will stand at the door and knock, and those who are faithful and watching will open the door, and he will come in and eat with them. You yourselves should be like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. And he will gird himself and will make them to sit down to meet to food and will come forth and serve them. Same idea here, but he's now saying, I'm knocking right now. And right now, I can come in and eat with you if you open the door to me. And yes, at the last day, connecting with Luke 12, I will knock at the door and you are to open to me immediately and I'll come in and we'll eat together. So, you see how it is that our attitude to him now is our attitude to him at the last day. He's knocking on your door now in various circumstances, situations. He's knocking on your door. Open immediately. It's that yes straight away that you like from your children. That's what he wants from us. Yes, straight away. That's why people were baptized immediately in the first century. And that continues in our lives now. He knocks on your door. The need is the call. The need is the call. You see a need, you open the door. And he will come in and eat with you. Now, we're going to take the bread and wine. He's knocking on our door and we're saying, yes, come in and eat with me. And yet what we are doing now as we take the bread and wine, as we eat with Jesus and he eats with us, is a foretaste of how he shall do this again when he returns. That when he comes back, there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what we are doing now in taking this bread and wine is a foretaste of how we shall eat with him in his kingdom. We are eating and drinking with him now. He is present here, as we do this, in our obscure, humble surroundings, in the quietness of a church hall, sitting in your car, sitting at home, sitting in your bedroom with the door shut so the kids don't disturb you, whatever, in those obscure, humble, little, normal situations of life where we break bread, this is looking forward to that far greater day when again we will eat and drink with him at his table in his kingdom. And it's a picture here of two men, I think, is the idea, that he knocks on the door, we open, and he enters and eats with us. Uh, and he with me and I with him. It's a picture of two men, two blokes sitting down to a meal. This is the intimacy. This is the intimacy that he wishes to have with us and that we can have with him. So then, when he comes, it's critical that we open immediately. And I'm not like the foolish virgins who go running off to buy their oil and don't say yes straight away. The minute he's back, yes, I want you in my life. I want to eat with you. And this is how it is now. We make the answer now because he's knocking on our door and he wants to take this bread and wine with us. He wants to fellowship us. So then, let's, let's give thanks for, for this bread. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your passionate interest in us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love. And as we eat and drink with you now, we long for that day when at last we shall eat and drink with you again in your kingdom. We know that you are real. We know that you will come again. We want you to come again. 
And we want in this life, as you continue knocking on the door of our hearts, to open immediately and to not resist you, to not think that we are not ready, but to open immediately with all our unpreparedness and weakness because we love you and we want to be with you. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this cup in which we see the symbol of the blood and the life of your dear Son poured out so freely for us. And Father, we pray that the day will soon come when at last your dear Son shall be back upon this earth and we shall rise from the dead or we shall be changed and we shall see him. We pray, Father, that you will open our eyes now that we might feel his presence near and that we might sense that we are in his presence please heavenly father go with us and guide us to the end that this might be our eternal destiny to eat and drink with him in his kingdom forever 